Hi guys, welcome back aboard Got Hold Athena for yet more DIY fun. This week I want to get started here in the aft cabin. Specifically I want to build a locker at the aft end of the aft cabin and also get the hull covered by insulation and wooden slats. The materials for the solar arch out in the cockpit are also supposed to show up this week so with a little bit of luck we'll also get to fiddle around with that a little bit. Why would I want to start working on the aft cabin now when there's only 103 days until we want to untie the lines and start the long journey to bring Athena from Europe to the US. I've got one of the reasons right here. This is Athena's isolation transformer. Both the isolation transformer and the Quattro 5000 inverter charger are going to get mounted on the bulkhead at the very aft end of the aft cabin. And we need those doohickeys to be able to use the induction cooktop, the electric oven, the washer, the dryer, all of that good stuff. This magic blue box provides galvanic isolation, meaning there is no conductive path between the source, which would be the shore power connection, and the load, which would be all of our doohickeys here aboard the boat. A step down on the feature ladder from the isolation transformer, you'll find something like a galvanic isolator, a sink saver, call it what you will, it's just a few diodes. But the isolation transformer and the sink saver are very much in different leagues. The isolation transformer is much heavier, much more expensive, but also much, much spiffier. Both from a feature standpoint and from a safety standpoint, the isolation transformer is the clear winner. And as a little bit of added sugar on top, when we make it to the US, the isolation transformer will step 110 volts up to 230 volts, which is what we need for all of our appliances. But let's not get bogged down in a bunch of technical yammering on. That's better saved for a later video. For now, I have got a locker to build. After a little bit of measuring and head scratching, I used a piece of MDF as a template to help me figure out the size of the bottom. Used a joggle stick to get it exact. Transferred that to plywood and cut that to rough size. And then trimmed some holes for the wiring and removed a bit of the old tabbing to make room for the new tabbing. And here we are. The bottom of the locker is now ready to get adhered in place. I'll use a little bit of epoxy thickened with 406 to adhere the bottom in place. With the temperatures we're having here right now, it shouldn't take more than a couple of hours for the thickened epoxy to gel. So if I apply a generous fillet of this stuff and wait a few hours, then I can lay up the tabbing, I can push down on the bottom without worrying about it shifting on me. Not only will the thickened epoxy secure the bottom, it'll also be easier to lay up the fiberglass. One of these wooden disposable spoons makes for a great tool for forming the fillet. That looks perfect. Now we play the waiting game. I might as well use that bit of time to get set up with the fiberglass I need. The only place I'm gonna lay up more than a couple of layers is up against the side of the hull. But for the rest, it doesn't really need to be that strong. Fiberglass, fin roller, brush, gloves. Chop chop, thickened epoxy. It's been about an hour and a half and this stuff is starting to firm up pretty good. So let's mix up some epoxy. That's a 10 pump. It... Uh oh, excuse me just a second. I'm not one for splurging on new clothing, but I don't think this is the type of clickbait that's gonna bring more views. A year and a half from brand new to catastrophic failure. I guess that's pretty good. Anywho, as I was saying, about 10 pumps should do. It's gonna be far easier for me to wet this out here instead of trying to do it on the surface of the hull. This is gonna be faster and a lot less messy. I got the bottom tab to the hull and the rest of the boat. The last thing I did yesterday was to use a laser level to mark the position of the supports for the wooden slats. I sanded the hull to get a good bond and then used more thickened epoxy with a little dab of hot glue to secure the supports while the epoxy cures. It's the next morning and this is now very much a permanent part of the hull. Now I need two layers of this plywood to be able to have enough room for the insulation, but pushing in two layers of the plywood required quite a lot of force. So I decided just to start with one layer and then today I can use a little bit more thickened epoxy and a screw to pull the two together. Down here, there is way too much of a curve for me to simply just push this piece of plywood in. So I'm either gonna have to curve the plywood or build this out of little blocks. Either way, let's save this for a little bit later. I don't wanna accidentally knock some of this out of alignment. 
This scraggly looking thing is the template for the front of the locker. This doesn't have to be hyper precise. Most of the edges are gonna get covered by trim. Well, let's see if we can get it reasonably close anyways. After a little bit of fine tuning with Mr. Angle Grinder, the front is now in place. It's not a perfect fit, but it's certainly good enough. Bam! Now we'll also be able to get into the little locker. And just like that, the frame is all adhered in place. I've repeated the process for the area below the locker. This area down here is how I'm gonna get cables and wiring up to the blue boxes without the cables or wiring being visible. Now let's get those bottom supports in place. I think I'm gonna go with curving. I've used this technique plenty of times before here on Athena. For instance, this up here is curved plywood. There's also down by the settee and this seat here by the nav station. Don't mind all of the sawdust and the cables, but yeah, look at that. The plywood is now super easy to get to conform to the shape of the hull. I hardly even have to push in on it. The astute are probably thinking, but wait, what about all the cuts? Well, those are gonna get filled with a little bit of thickened epoxy. And just as before, the back gets a little dab of hot glue and yet more thickened epoxy. I'll secure the front with a screw just to make absolutely sure nothing shifts around. It's the next day and the epoxy has cured nicely, so I've swung by the workshop and picked up all of my mahogany slats. The slats are gonna cover up the insulation that's gonna go in between the supports. It is a time-consuming and fiddly task to fit them. It's the exact same process I used out in the forward cabin about two months ago, and also here in the saloon about two weeks ago. Only this time around, there is much more of a curve to the hull in this end of the aft cabin, and that complicates things because of the changing angles. But we'll get through it. It's just a little bit of a fiddly process. I'll use the loose one here to measure for the next slat, and uh, well, then we better get the production line started. Phew, that was about six hours of fiddling around, but at least it looks pretty dang spiffy. Now I'll remove all of the slats again, number them and bring them up to the workshop where I'm gonna varnish them. A while back, somebody suggested that I should just varnish all of the slats before I cut them to size. But I don't really like that idea because then if I mess up a slat that I can't use, well, then I've wasted all the effort that went into varnishing it. And putting them up again after I've already done the first dry fit, it's not really that time consuming. There's gonna be a piece of trim that covers this up so that this becomes a little shelf to put stuff on. So yeah, I think it's all gonna look really nice, but uh, let me go ahead and get these pulled back down again. At Board Athena, I use two different brands of paint. I use PPG's Sigma paints for all the hidden areas, like the inside of the lockers, and then I use International's products for the visible surfaces, like the outside of the locker in the aft cabin. The reason is simple, it's cost versus looks. I get a much nicer look with the International products, but the Sigma products are a fair bit cheaper. Both products are two-part paints and good quality products. I've just never really been able to get a good surface finish without orange peeling when applying Sigma products with a roller or a brush. So hence the little bit of a dual approach. I seem to have much better luck with the International, or if you're in the US, Interlux products. This is the first coat of interior finish on this guy, and it looks pretty much perfect. The frame still needs one more coat of interior finish, but other than that, this is what the aft cabin looks like, all white and bright. Before I start putting up insulation in the aft cabin, there is something else I wanna install. 
And it's inside of this spiffy blue box. Oh, my, 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 a blue box inside of a blue box. This thing is not exactly lightweight at 30 kilos or 66 pounds. No comments from the weight fanatics, please. Yes, I am adding a little bit of weight to Athena. No, I am not worried about that weight and I'm not worried about the weight distribution either. If a boat built like Athena couldn't handle a little bit of weight, there would be very few floating long distance cruising boats in the world, yet they seem to be everywhere. If you're concerned about weight, then do definitely not worry about the 230 kilos or 500 pounds of 10 millimeter chain I'm going to be adding to the chain locker. Please note that I'm saying this with a smile. I am joking a little bit here. Of course, weight and weight distribution is something you need to be aware of. It's just not, for me at least, as big of a concern as some people would like to make it out to be in the comment section. I think it all depends on where you come from. If you come from a smaller boat, a lighter boat, or maybe a super performance geared boat, well then yeah, weight is probably gonna be more of an issue for you. But for Athena, the inverter charger, the gen sets, the batteries, all of that, it's perfectly fine. Anywho, this chunky monkey of a blue box is our inverter charger. It's the Quattro 5000. Not accounting for power factor or thermal throttling, this would be able to deliver 5,000 watts worth of juice from the 24 volt DC battery bank. As the name implies, this is both an inverter and a charger in one box. And when we feed this beast with either the shore power connection or the gen set in the technical compartment, we'll be able to pump roughly 120 amps at 24 volts into the battery bank. At that rate, we'll be sucking down a whooping 16 amps of juice from a 230 volt shore power connection. And a lot of places in the world, the shore power connection just won't handle that. And in that case, we'll simply just dial back the awesomeness of the blue box a little bit. But it brings us to another cool feature of this box. Right here on the front of the box, it says power assist. This is not a feature that's unique to Victron gear or even to the Quattro. The Multi Plus also has this feature. But what it means is that if we're somewhere where the shore power connection is too weak for us to power, for instance, the induction cooktop or the electric oven, well then this blue box will suck out a bit of juice from the batteries to boost up whatever we can get from shore so that we can actually run what we want to run. Let's say we're somewhere in the world where we can only draw a few amps from a shore power connection. That's not enough to run, for instance, the dryer, but it is enough to charge the batteries over a longer period of time. And then if we want to run one of those high peak loads, well then the power assist feature will help us boost the shore power connection. In that regard, the batteries act kind of like a buffer. Of course, in this example, we could also just run the gen set, but you guys get the point. Power assist, really cool feature. If if you have high loads on a boat and you're not entirely sure how good the shore power connection is going to be. Monitoring and managing power consumption here aboard Athena is going to be very important. And to help us do that, I've got this GX50 touch display that we're going to mount right up here. This display will make it super easy to understand what's flowing in from, for instance, solar, the high output alternator, the gen set, shore power, whatever, versus what's being consumed by, for instance, Ava's hairdryer. The decision to go full electric for cooking with induction and electric oven did have some associated cost. This is a fairly expensive blue box at roughly the equivalent of 4,000 US dollars. You might be thinking, holy turd, that's a lot of money to spend just on cooking. And that would be true, but getting this big inverter has some other upsides. Like for instance, that we'll be able to run the dryer, the washing machine, the water maker, the dive compressor, my little tick welder, stuff like that. There's basically no household appliance we won't be able to run here aboard Athena. Granted, we won't be able to run everything at the same time or even that many things at the same time, but if we disregard the power factor and the thermal throttling and we run the gen set at the same time, this will be able to pump out somewhere right around 9,000 watts worth of juice. That is a lot of juice. That's not really a use case though. We'd only be able to do that for something like 40 minutes and then we'd be all out of battery juice. So yeah, but you guys get the point. Having a big inverter gives you a lot of flexibility. I'll go into plenty more details in a few weeks when hopefully we'll be able to install the batteries, the BMS and get all of this hooked up. In this video, all I wanna do is to get those two blue boxes mounted down there so that they're installed and out of the way. They both mount using these blue supports here that slot into the back and Victron includes screws. For the sake of paranoia, I'm gonna replace a couple of these screws with some through bolted fasteners with some nice washers on the back 
just like I said, for the sake of paranoia. <laughs> That's one down, one to go. I ended up going all in on the paranoia and just through bolting everything. Tightening the nuts was for once a nice and comfortable position aboard a boat. That's basically unheard of. But I would be lying if I said that getting the inverted charger into place was easy. But ta-da! That looks pretty dang spiffy. Right now, both of these are just hanging on their little blue support doohickeys. That's not very sturdy considering the boat is gonna be jumping around all over the place. But there are also holes in the bottom of the chassis for through bolting that. And once those are in, they should be very secure. Just like I did in last week's video, I used paper templates to cut nice snug fitting pieces of Armaflex to insulate the hull. That looks a little something like this. Tomorrow, I should be ready to put up the wooden slats. I picked up some of these Lucky Lachy type doohickeys here, and I picked up enough of them that we can have all of them match in the aft cabin. So the two access points to the locker and also to the engine compartment. I think Ava will appreciate that little detail. Fingers crossed, this guy still fits. Heat and therefore thermal throttling is probably going to be an issue in my little locker, but I've got room up nearby the cockpit combing to put a fan that's going to push hot air into the cockpit locker, and I can draw in colder air from the bottom. So we've got some different options to play around with in there, but let's hold off on that until we know how much heat I need to get rid of. For now, I'm happy with how this looks, so uh, let me head up to the workshop and pick up the mahogany slats so I can finish this week's to-do list. Ooh, that's some mighty fine looking wood if I do say so myself. Hopefully everything still fits. Let's rewind real quick and remember what the forward cabin looked like in the beginning of the week. And here is what it looks like now. I think that's a big improvement. I'm waiting for some laser cut parts to show up that I need to finish this area where the lithium batteries are going to stay. And I kind of need to finish that before I can finish this little cabinet area. Those areas are all planned out so I just need to get the materials and then I can just do it. But there is something I don't know what to do about, and that's this hump here. I don't know how to make that look nice and insulated because I want to keep as much room here as I can. I don't want a sharp corner down here because you're going to be bumping into that a lot. So yeah, that's a little bit of a head scratcher. Monday, I'm driving down to pick up the first load of the new cushions for the boat. But uh, yeah, those are of course banned from the boat until I'm done being uh, Dusty McDusterson. So yeah, maybe you guys will see a quick glimpse of them. But after I've picked up the cushions, I think I better get started installing the tracks. This is the one for the stay sail and the one for the head sail should show up in the beginning of next week. It would also be cool to get started on the head soon. I don't know if it's too soon because as you might be able to see, it is kind of my storage area, but it is one of the larger unfinished areas I still have to deal with. So it would be good to get started soon, but yeah, maybe next week. But today is Sunday and that means this video is gonna go live in a few hours, which means I better get to editing. So uh, yeah, I hope to see all of you guys back here at Boratina next week for yet more DIY fun. As always, feel free to leave a comment down below and don't forget, if you've enjoyed this video, remember to leave a like. See you.